I never get used to orders of service. I was planning on there being one more song or something. I don't know. All right, you can turn your Bibles to Numbers chapter 16. We're going to cover Numbers chapter 16 and 17 today, but we're not going to read every verse. There's a lot there, and that would take up a little bit too much time. So we're going to read uh, the highlights of the story. We're going to make sure that we cover what's here and talk about what it means for us, but we won't be reading every verse. Um, Before we get started, um, I want to pray. Uh, You can be turning to Numbers 16. Verse 1. Lord, thank you for everything you've given to us. God, I pray that you would help us to love you and to serve you. God, I pray that you would help me as I preach. God, that you would just uh, guide and direct. God, that it would be your words and not mine. That your word would speak and people would hear what you've put in here for us to learn. We thank you for the opportunity to gather and ask that you would just bless us here during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So this story is a continuation of the theme that we have been seeing in the book of Numbers. There's some murmuring and complaining. Go figure. Uh, There's some accusations made. There are quite a few untimely deaths brought on by judgment. Uh, It's the next verse of the song, so to speak. So this is the murmuring song. It started in Exodus, we're in Numbers, and it's just continuing. However, this story is a little bit different in that it is a large-scale, full-on rebellion against Moses and Aaron that is brought on to overthrow the priesthood. Look with me at verses 1 through 7. Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown, And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron, and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves uh, above the congregation of the Lord? And when Moses heard it, he fell on his face. And he spake unto Korah and unto all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his, and who is holy, and he will cause him to come near unto him. Even him whom he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. This do, take your censers, Korah and all his company, and put fire therein, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy. Ye take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. So unlike the previous challenges to Moses' authority, we now see an organized conspiracy. So this isn't Miriam and Aaron. This isn't some random people who are complaining about food. This is led by Korah and other princes of the congregation. These were no ordinary protesters. They're famous. It says that they were princes, famous in the congregation. They're men of renown. These guys are a big deal, and they wield a lot of influence. So we'll see in a moment what the main issue is, but their accusation is that Moses has taken too much authority upon himself. They say, you take too much upon you, because all of the congregation is holy. Every one of them. Moses, what's wrong with you? They're all holy. You have no business lifting yourself up. They say, Moses, you're just prideful. You take in a position that doesn't belong to you. You think too much of yourself. All the people are holy. And these men, Korah and the princes, have taken it upon themselves to represent the people and to make sure that they balance the scales of justice. So they have the congregation's best interests in mind, of course, right? Uh, it's, It's not just personal. They're representing everybody. So here's the main idea of the story, and this is what the sermon is about. This is what we'll talk about, and it will carry us through the end of chapter 16 and into chapter 17. How do you determine who is holy? We might ask it like this. What are holy people like, and what do they do? The answer is that God determines who is holy, and this story is going to show us what holy people are like. Moses responds in verse 7 by issuing a challenge. He says, God will choose who is holy. And he states, ye take too much upon you, ye sons of Levi. So meek Moses doesn't look so meek in this moment because he is now defending God. This isn't a personal matter. They're not attacking Moses. They're attacking God and the authority structure that God has placed in the congregation. So like most rebels and uh, how they operate, Korah and his company are manipulating the crowd to think that they're pursuing their interests. You see, Moses, all of these people are holy. You're just full of pride. And that resonates with the people. Because was it God's intention for them to be holy? 
Sure it was. They're the people of Israel. Uh, God set the nation apart to be holy. He set them apart. He commanded them to be holy. And it was their job to display God's glory to the nations. But they weren't doing a very good job of that. They're not holy at this time. They're not doing so great. So the current congregation had been faithless. This is maybe a year or less, probably less, after they um, refused to go into the land of Canaan because of the report of the twelve or the ten spies that had been faithless. So they didn't listen to the good spies. They murmured and complained. And while they were called to be holy, this was not a time that they were right with God. So these rebels are dishonest. They're just trying to bring people into their side. Look at verses 8 through 11 with me. And Moses said unto Korah, Hear, I pray you, ye sons of Levi, seemeth it but a small thing unto you, that the God of Israel hath separated you from the congregation of Israel, to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them? And he hath brought thee near to him, and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee. And seek ye the priesthood also? For which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron, that ye murmur against him? So Moses gets right to the heart of the issue. He says, you are ministers of the congregation. These are no ordinary Jews. The Jews were a special people. And the Levites were special Jews. They were set apart for the service of the tabernacle. They had a high calling. They had lots of responsibility. And he calls them out for their pride and their lust for power. He says, God has brought you near to him, but you're not content. You want the priesthood. They want the priesthood. They want to take Aaron's spot and Moses' spot as the leaders of the congregation. So they're not content with their service in the tabernacle. Uh, They want a bigger slice of the leadership pie. We often fall into this trap. It's easy to look at these guys and say, oh man, these are bad guys. But if we look close enough, we'll see ourselves. We're not content with the two talents that the master has given us, and we want more. And perhaps being faithful would lead to responsibility and more, but instead we just want, I want his job. I want his responsibilities. Why don't I get his benefits? God, you've not been fair to me in what you've given me. This is not to illustrate that leadership is always right. Aaron has been wrong before. Moses is going to be wrong later, and he's been wrong before. But God deals with that. God dealt with those people at those times. But these men have taken it upon themselves to set Moses and Aaron straight. And Moses recognizes this for what it is. This is a rebellion against God and his plan. And I keep using the word rebellion, and maybe that sounds like a strong word. Um, but I want to quote, uh, or to read Jude verse 11. Uh, it's the only time that Korah is mentioned in the New Testament. Um, Jude verse 11 says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for a reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. In the Bible, this word gainsaying carries the idea of rebellion. It literally means to speak out uh, in opposition to or to contradict. So Korah has moved beyond complaining. Complaining was one thing. God didn't like that, but that's one level. Now he's gainsaying. He's a rebel. He's speaking out in opposition, and he's calling for Moses and Aaron to step down. God calls these gainsayers rebels in chapter 17. So there are many reasons that people could fall into rebellion, that people could rebel like Korah did. It obviously begins with pride. In Korah's case, it may actually be because there's some jealousy involved. Actually, if you look at Korah's lineage, it mentions in the first few verses of the chapter who Korah is. And he's not an ordinary Levite. He's Moses and Aaron's cousin. He's his cousin, he's their cousin, and he probably doesn't feel like he is getting enough respect, right? Moses and Aaron, they've always been in charge, they've been leading, and he's fed up with it. And now, because they can't go into the promised land, he's got nothing to look forward to. So now he wants to take their spot. So these rebels are trying to solve the leadership problem that they're facing. And they want Moses and Aaron out. And they're going to rally the whole congregation up, uh, and they're going to bring them to their side and try to take over. They're just in it for themselves. Family matters can often be an issue when it comes to the performance of ministry. God's plan sometimes elevates a person into leadership that we have an issue with. And so sometimes it's about ourself. We say, man, I I should be in charge. I should be the leader. And sometimes it's on behalf of a close friend or a family member that we can look and say, man, I just don't feel like this is playing out right. And churches, families, and even entire towns and countries can quickly slide into a clan attitude that puts us versus them. But God's not part of any clans. 
He evaluates his servants on their own merit, and he knows what they're capable of, and he knows what they can do, and he knows who is fit for what purpose. So too often we let our own judgment get in the way of God's plans for leadership as well as ministry. We see in verses 12 through 14 that discontentment and faithlessness are also part of what makes people into rebels. They're not holy, they're pretenders. Look with me at verse 12. And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, which said, We will not come up. Is it a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of the land that floweth with milk and honey, to kill us in the wilderness, except thou make thyself altogether a prince over us? Moreover, thou hast not brought us into a land that floweth with milk and honey, or given us an inheritance of fields and vineyards. Wilt thou put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. So Moses calls for the two co-conspirators uh, to have a face-to-face. -face. He's not talking to Corey, he's talking to Dathan and Abiram. And they refuse. So did you notice their grounds for a refusal? They said, you have brought us out of the land flowing with milk and honey. Wait, what? He brought them out of Egypt. They were slaves. They, that wasn't the land of milk and honey. And then they say, and you didn't bring us to the land that is flowing with milk and honey. And you didn't give us an inheritance. We were promised fields and vineyards. Moses. Where's the fields and vineyards? But if you pause for a moment and think about this, this is crazy. Because Moses did take them to the promised land. He led them out of Egypt by the grace of God, and they went to the promised land. And when they got there, they didn't go in. So this is their fault. But they blame it on Moses. So they're dissatisfied with Moses and Aaron because of the results of their own faithlessness. I'm upset because of the way things are, and it's your fault. It's not my fault. It's never my fault. It's always somebody else's. It's not my fault that I don't like how things are going. It's your fault, Moses, pastor, mom, dad, boss. It's not my fault. It's always somebody else's fault that things are the way that they are. It's on you, God. That's what it really is. It's a display of human nature. It's a display of rebellion. And their lack of faith caused a chain reaction. So first you see that they missed out on the blessings. Well, that's bad. And then they think back to the past and remember things better than they actually were. Egypt wasn't all that great. And they were slaves. Uh, they were killing their children. That's a terrible thing. And they're like, man, it used to be good. They look back and Dathan says, man, remember the Nile? We were never thirsty when we had the Nile. It's like, <laughs> this, is, this is crazy. And Dathan says, yeah, and we'd have water and milk and honey. If it weren't for you, Moses, it's your fault. It's crazy. They're blaming Moses and Aaron for the consequences of their own actions. It's okay to have fond memories of the past, but if you find yourself constantly thinking about the past and wishing things were that way, make sure that you're not guilty of this. Blaming people for things that aren't their fault or making problems where there are none. When we're discontent, our murmuring and our complaining reflects our own attitude towards God and it shows how strong or weak our faith is. Our discontentment can lead to rebellion and it warps our judgment. If you look at what Dathan and Abiram said after that, they actually allowed their rebellion to distort their view of Moses. Look at verse 14. He says, Moreover, thou hast not brought us into a land that floweth with milk and honey, or given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Wilt thou put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. Now think about this with me. We've gone through Exodus and Leviticus, and now we're in number 16. Remember all those stories about Moses gouging out the eyes of people that oppose him? No, me neither. He, he's not like that. But they look at Moses and they say, you're a dictator. We're not coming up because you're going to torture us. That's what they're saying. And that's ridiculous. Moses is a loving man. He's a, a person of grace. He's a meek man. But their rebellion has twisted their minds so that they see their leader and they see someone who's not really there. They are in the wrong. We hear about this happening all the time today. A teenager thinks that her parents are cruel because they won't let her have Instagram on her phone. An employee hates their boss. Why? Because they want to, them to work, at least a little, you know? It's like, man, that guy, he's a jerk. Can't stand him. It's like, he just wants you to work a little. <laughs> and people often don't like uh, people in uh, positions of authority. People often don't like preachers, not because they're bad people or because they're liars, but because they tell them the truth. People make up all kinds of stuff. Moses was a meek man, a loving man, who cared for the congregation. In fact, we see his love and care is the primary difference between him and and his cousin Korah. Moses and Aaron were holy, not the rebels. Look with me at verses 20 through 22. This is where we see what holiness looks like. 
And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin, and wilt thou be wroth with all the congregation? God tells Moses and Aaron to get out. He says, Separate yourselves from the congregation. He says, I'm going to destroy them. He's done with the rebellion. He's tired of the gainsaying. He's tired of the murmuring. And he's going to destroy the whole nation. But Moses and Aaron intercede. They pray to God. They say, God, have mercy. Please don't judge the congregation because of Korah's sin. They fall on their faces and pray. And here we see the difference. This is the difference between people that are holy and the people that just are pretenders. While Korah struts around and tries to gather people to his rebellious cause, Moses and Aaron lie down on their faces in the hot sand and they pray. They pray for the congregation. They pray for the people that have turned against them to follow the prideful rebels. And so many of us today walk around saying, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm holy. I'm doing a pretty good job. And yet we live so selfishly. We live and for ourselves. We try to gain unearned power and influence or money. And we put on a show so that everyone knows that we're a Christian. But what do holy people do? This is what the text teaches us. What do the real people of God do? They pray. They give themselves and their time. They sacrifice their ambitions and their wills only to be gossiped and slandered by the ones that they pray for. Christian, do you intercede for the people around you? Do you pray for your neighbors? Do you pray for your pastor? Do you pray for the people in the church that are struggling instead of looking at them and saying, God, I wish you'd judge them. I just can't stand them. Do you pray for them? I wonder how often we miss the will of God because we refuse to pray. We're too caught up in ourselves. We're contributing to problems and we don't actually pray for people and intercede like Moses and Aaron did. We'll give all of our energy to our work, to our hobbies, to our interests. But when it comes time to pray, we're too busy or too tired. We don't do it. We don't pray for those around us that are facing the judgment of God. Look at verse 23. Uh, here we see um, it begins to describe the judgment, the destruction that God brings upon the rebels. <clears throat> and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Moses went up and went unto Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. So they got up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram on every side. And Dathan and Abiram came out, and stood in the door of their tents, and their wives, and their sons, and their little children. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of my own mind. If these men die the common death of all men, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth, and swallow them up with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick into the pit, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, and their houses, and all the men that appertained unto Korah, and all their goods. They, and all that appertained to them, went down alive into the pit. And the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. And all Israel that were round about them fled at the cry of them. For they said, Lest the earth swallow us up also. And there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. God spared the congregation because of the prayers of Moses and Aaron, but Korah and his men were still standing in opposition to God. So Moses tells everyone to back away from the part of camp where they were at, and the part of camp where they lived, and explains that if these men die of old age, then Moses was in the wrong. But if the Lord opens up the earth, and it swallows them up and all their belongings, then you'll know that those rebels have provoked the Lord. Moses proclaims confidently that judgment is coming because he's not led the nation based on things that he's thought in his own mind. Just because he was the leader didn't mean he was wrong. He wasn't greedy for power or gain. Leaders are necessary. God knew that Moses was the perfect man to lead the congregation, and uh, he was doing his job. So sure enough, the earth is opened, and Korah's men fall down into the pit. All the princes that had sided with Korah were now consumed with fire sent by God, and the judgment was finished. Isn't that a little harsh? Don't you think? It's like you might ask, uh, okay, well, isn't that a little harsh that he just, you know, swallowed them up? Couldn't he have just said, hey, guys, you know, knock it off? 
If you look at 1 Samuel, um, we don't need to turn there, but 1 Samuel 15, 23, the first part of the verse, Samuel is speaking, and he says, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. When God sees a rebel, he sees a sin so dark and so heinous that witches, demon worshipers, people who practice voodoo are no worse than he or she is. If you're a rebel, you're aligning yourself with the darkest, most evil things that have ever come to pass on this earth. Rebellion, like witchcraft, is anti-God, and it will carry consequences. So that's it, right? The rebels go down in the pit, and it's all over. Look with me at verse 41. It's not quite over yet. But on the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. And it came to pass, when the congregation was gathered against Moses and against Aaron, that they looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation, and, behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. And Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Get you up from among this congregation, that I may consume them as in a moment. And they fell upon their faces. Rebellion is infectious. Korah didn't just have Dathan and Abiram and the 250 princes fooled. He had the entire congregation duped. They had the whole nation riled up. They were holy after all, right? They, they had just as much right to speak for God as Moses did. So they murmur and they say, Moses, you've killed the people of the Lord. That's crazy. Moses didn't dig the pit. They just saw what happened. The earth opened up and it swallowed the rebels. Aaron didn't do that. He doesn't have a shovel that big and he's ancient, right? Like they're out of their minds, but their rebellion has distorted their view of what happened. God disposed of the rebels, not Moses and Aaron. The congregation is so far from God personally that they don't recognize what God is doing. They look at the destruction of the rebels and they say, Hey, those were our kind of people. Those are God's people. They were good guys. Who do you think you are, Moses? They don't see it for what it is. So God is ready to destroy the congregation again for their wicked unbelief. But Moses and Aaron intercede again. Look at verse 46. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a censer, and put fire therein from off the altar, and put on incense, and go quickly into the congregation, and make an atonement for them. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord. The plague is begun. And Aaron took, as Moses commanded, and ran into the midst of the congregation. And behold, the plague was begun among the people. And he put on incense and made an atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stayed. Now they that died in the plague were 14,700, beside them that died about the matter of Korah. And Aaron returned unto Moses under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the plague was stayed. Moses and Aaron are praying again, and again they fall on their faces in the sand, and they intercede for the rebellious people. The shouts of murmuring are still outside the tent, as God warns of coming destruction, but Moses and Aaron won't stop praying. He looks to Aaron, and he says, The plague has begun. Get the censer. Aaron, we've got to do something. The plague is starting. God's wrath is here. The only thing that's standing between them and destruction is you and your intercession. In this passage, Aaron is working as a high priest to intercede for the people. And it's a picture of Christ. Jesus came to earth to stand between the dead and the living and to offer an atonement. While we were yet sinners, he died for us. Aaron and Moses are only living and acting like holy men because of the work that God did in their lives. They were looking forward to the time when God himself would step down into a world that was torn by sin a world full of people who hated God and follow rebels. He stepped down in the midst of people heading for judgment and he made an atonement. He interceded for us. Jesus is now at the right hand of the Father and he's still interceding. It's what he does. And to be holy is to be like Jesus. He's the mediator, the intercessor, the one who gives his life for those who are unthankful. He did not seek his own will, but the will of the Father who loved even the rebels. Moses and Aaron, these holy men, lived out a life of sacrifice and intercession. The rebels had everyone fooled. The people looked at men like Korah and Dathan and Abiram and said, Man, those are people of God. They thought that they were the men of God. But the real people of God were marked by mercy and by prayer. I think too often we're like Korah and we see the things of God as a way to get ahead. 
we see the church and we say, oh, there's a place I could have power or influence or status, and we lift ourselves up. We're like the rebels. Or at best, maybe we're like Jonah, and we preach the word reluctantly, hoping that the rebels get what's coming to them. We look at the lost world or the sinning brethren, and we say, God, won't you just wipe them out? Would you just take care of those people, please? But it's so rare for us as Christians to look at the lost world and the rebellious people in the church and be willing to fall on our faces and give ourselves to the work of intercession. Moses and Aaron did not pray for the congregation because they agreed with them or because they liked them. If anybody had a reason to not like anybody, it was Moses and the congregation. I, those guys were a thorn in his side. They were constantly causing him trouble, but yet he falls on his face and he prays them because he loves them with the love that God had for them. They had enough love and mercy in their hearts to pray for them even when they were rebelling against them. Today we look to Jesus as the only one who can intercede and make an atonement for sinners. He did that work on the cross 2,000 years ago, but God is also the judge, and the only thing standing between the rebels and the pit, or the congregation and the plague, is the prayers of the people of God. We like to think about holiness in terms of what we don't do, right? I don't smoke, I don't gamble, I don't curse, so I'm holy, right? I've, I've got it down. But being holy isn't just about what we don't do. It has to go further than that. It's about being like Jesus. Being like Jesus means not being like the world. That's part of it. But it also means being like Jesus. Well, what does Jesus do? He intercedes for people. If we examined your life, would we see a person that lives like Jesus? Would we see a life that's marked by mercy and prayer? Or would we see the greedy, discontented, rebellious attitude that described Korah? I think most of us live in that place most often. We very rarely live in a place where we are constantly um, showing mercy in, in prayer. Turn to chapter 17, verse number 1. We're almost done with the story. Verse 1 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and take every one of them a rod according to the house of their fathers. Of all their princes, according to the house of their fathers, twelve rods, Write thou every man's name upon his rod, and thou shalt write Aaron's name upon the rod of Levi. For one rod shall be for the head of the house of their fathers. And thou shalt lay them in the tabernacle of the congregation before the testimony, where I will meet with you. And it shall come to pass that the man's rod whom I shall choose shall blossom, and I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the children of Israel, whereby they murmur against you. Jump down to verse 8. And it came to pass that on the morrow Moses went into the tabernacle of witness, and behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded, and brought forth buds, and bloomed blossoms, and yielded almonds. <clears throat> so God caused Aaron's rod to bud, and it was clear for everybody that he was the chosen high priest. Verse 10 says that God commanded Moses to keep the rod so that they would have a token against them. A token against the rebels. So whenever um, the rebels wanted to murmur, they had the rod to look at and say, okay, here's a miracle that proved that Aaron was the high priest. And the point of the passage is that God will stand behind his servants. So God had appointed the leadership of Aaron and Moses. They weren't making it up. They weren't yielding their own authority. They weren't lifting themselves up as princes, as Dathan and Abiram had charged Moses. They were operating through and under the authority of God. So if you're in a position of authority in your life, whether you're a church leader or a parent or a supervisor at work, when you do right and stand with God, God will stand with you. That doesn't mean everything will go your way. Sometimes life is still hard. But it does mean that God has a plan and he'll stand with you. But remember that Korah was a leader too. It's not just followers who rebel. Sometimes leaders make the best rebels because they can gather a following to go with them. It wasn't just Dathan and Abiram that died. It was also their little ones, their little children. If you've been privileged with authority, you can lead those who follow you into rebellion just as well as someone can walk into it on their own. When you, do, when you intercede and you live a life of mercy, God stands with you. When you rebel, you're standing in danger of judgment. So be like Moses and Aaron in the story. Better be like Jesus. He's the ultimate mediator and intercessor. So pray for your lost friends and your neighbors. Pray for the people in the church that you might have issues with. We're just people. We all have problems. And sometimes we tend to look at people and say, man, I wish God would judge them instead of doing the Christian thing, which is to pray for them. 
God has a plan for his people, and prayer has a huge part in it. I'm going to close this in prayer, and then, Pastor, if you want to come up. Lord, thank you for everything you've given to us. God, I pray that you would do a work in our hearts, help us to um, follow your word. God, I pray that you would help us to be people of prayer, people that are known for mercy and interceding because it's like Christ. God, we know that we can't do this on our own. It has to be a work of the Spirit in our hearts because of our growth and knowledge of the truth. God, I pray that you would do this in my life. I pray that you'd help each one of us in the church to walk closely with you, to have a heart that's like the heart of Jesus, and to intercede for those around us. In Jesus' name, amen.